Good morning, everybody. I'm going to give everybody a couple of seconds to get into the room and check their audio setting. All right, good morning, everybody. From those of us from those of us with Vigilant Fire and EMS Training and CypherWorks Incorporated, we wanna welcome you to our eight week webinar series, Managing Your Fire Service Training. We appreciate you for joining us for the informative workshop. Each week we'll provide some training on a different aspect of managing your fire service program. After each week, you'll receive an email with a certificate. Please keep those for your professional development records. Please use the chat function if you have any questions or need anything as we'll be monitoring the chat. And at this time, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Todd Smith, who will be leading the training. Todd is the CEO and founder of Vigilant Fire Service Training, and he has 28 years of fire service experience and is a certified New York State Municipal and Fire Instructor. Thanks so much, Todd. Take it away. Well, thanks a lot, Chris. <clears throat> and here we are, week five, talking about managing the fire service training program. And so today we're going to do what we've been doing for the past several weeks, and we're going to review exactly what it takes to manage your fire service training program. And then we're going to dive a little bit deeper into one aspect of the training program. And today's focus is going to be on the training plan. So how do we operate the actual program itself? So let's get started. Uh, if you've ever gone to the firehouse on drill night, or you uh, have sat down to the coffee table for your shift, and heard what are we doing for drill today or tonight, then you might be operating under a fire service training program that is not being run as effectively as, as it could be, <coughs> or as efficiently as it could be. So managing the fire service training program is the most time consuming task in the entire fire service. Uh, outside of the fire chief, uh, the fire training officer, whoever's in charge of the training of the fire department, has the most responsibility on their shoulders. Uh, the amount of time it takes to effectively and efficiently manage a fire service training program is tremendous. Uh, if we just looked at a couple of different things that the training officer is responsible for, they have to identify what their training requirements actually are. They have to identify the skill level of their firefighters that they need to be training. If they're going to identify that skill level, they need to develop a process to assess that skill so they need to figure out how they can uh, tell what skill level their firefighters are at. And then they need to identify what training is actually needed based on that skill assessment. Once you figure out what training you're going to need, you're going to have to develop a plan to meet the requirements of the training that is needed. Following that, you got to develop a schedule where you're going to deliver the training that you develop. And once you develop the different training lessons for those sessions, you're gonna to have to develop a presentation for each one of those lessons. And then we have to actually deliver that training to a captive audience, which might be the, the hardest thing that we do. <coughs> and then once the training is completed, we have to record each training session and then maintain a record of those uh, training records themselves. So as you can see, I could have filled this entire slide with many more responsibilities of the training officer. But here's just a couple right here. So we've listed 10 of the most prominent. So again, managing that fire service training program is a time consuming task. What we're gonna talk about today is how to do it effectively. <clears throat> so we have all these tasks we have to do. How do we take care of this as a whole? Well, the best way to take care of it as a whole is to break it down into individual steps. And that's what we've done. We've broken the process down into five individual steps beginning with a needs assessment. <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me, I have been sick for like three weeks. This is getting ridiculous at this point. And I haven't coughed until I sat down here to talk with you nice folks. So we start out with our needs assessment and then we move on to program development. <coughs> From the program development, we then operate the program where we're delivering the program that we developed to our actual people. And then we have to assess that program to see how well that program is operating. From the program, uh, evaluation, we then uh, fine tune our overall operation, develop a little bit, uh, uh, develop our training to, to hit different key areas, 
so on and so forth. And then we have to record everything that we do as well. So we break this down into five individual steps. That starts out with a needs assessment. So when we perform our needs assessment, we break it into two different categories, internal and external. We'll start out with the external. <coughs> so the external training requirement, that's where we get uh, uh, the requirements that are brought to us from outside the agency itself. This is where uh, federal laws come into play, state laws, maybe even local laws. These are the laws that require specific training. Typically, they don't have much to do with fire service training itself, and they're usually based on simple employer-employee uh, based training. And we have standards. Now, the standards get more specific to the fire service, and that starts out with OSHA, Occupation Safety and Health Administration, 1910-156, which is called the Fire Brigade Standard. Outside of the OSHA standard, the regulation for fire brigades is the National Fire Protection Agency Standard 1001, which is the standard for professional firefighter. And that sets the knowledge and skill capabilities uh, required for firefighters one and two on a national level. And then we have mandates. What mandates are is mandates something the governments like to use to close the gap between a need and a current law. So when there isn't a current law to fit a current need, they come up with these funny things called mandates. And most states have uh, specific mandates to uh, require you to do training on things like sexual harassment, workplace violence, uh, active shooter type things, uh, and bloodborne pathogens if your uh, agency is going to be um, working with, with, with people or patients who have bodily fluids, as well as hazmat and Article 26 training which is called need to know or right to know, excuse me, where the, the worker has to be uh, told everything, every hazardous material that they'll be involved with while they operate inside their workplace. So that's our external requirement, broken down into laws, standards, and mandates. And the best way to find these is by reviewing your local laws, okay? So that might be uh, looking at your state law book, taking a look at uh, whether or not your state is an OSHA state, uh, uh, or a federal OSHA state, or if they have a state approved plan from OSHA, and then reviewing the NFPA standards themselves. These are all just good things to get into if you are involved with training anyways, because it's important to understand what the professional standards are and what the requirements are of our firefighters on a national standard, on national level, excuse me. We then look at the internal uh, requirement. And the internal focus is a little bit easier, but it does bank itself back on the organizational needs and where we figure out what we actually have to do is by investigating those organizational needs. And OSHA 1910-156, that fire brigade standard, again, identifies how we can go through this process. And what the OSHA uh, needs us to do is they need us to create a, uh, a organizational statement. And that statement basically says what your organization does, who you are, what your leadership hierarchy is, how many members do you have, what responses, what functions do you provide what services do you provide as an organization? And how do you prepare to handle those services? So in other words, what type of training do you do? What is the frequency of your training? And what is the amount of the required training? So once we create this organizational statement that basically states all of these things, we now have a good idea of what it is for organizational internal needs for training requirements. To put it simply, if your fire organization responds to structure fires, then we need to train our firefighters commensurate to the duty of structural firefighting. That means that we need to train them in suppression. So that's moving hose, advancing hose lines, how to choose and select a proper stream, how to flow a proper stream, how to attack the fire both directly and indirectly. It would probably also involve some uh, tactical ventilation training. We're gonna need to understand how tactical ventilation operates, you gotta understand that tactical ventilation is the introduction of fresh air, not just the exhausting of bad air. You need to understand where to do it, how to do it, and how to effectively make that happen in the most efficient way. And we also need to train our firefighters in rescue operations. And that includes both search and victim removal. So basically, at Vigilant, what we preach all the time is we, our firefighters to be effective at their jobs, need to have mastered the skills of hose, ground ladders, and PPE, including their SCBA. Once we have mastered those things, then we can handle just about any situation that's in front of us 
as far as structural firefighting goes, okay? So, but those are the needs of a structural firefighting outfit, an operation that goes to reported structure fires. Now, if your organization also responds to motor vehicle accidents and you perform auto extrication, then your firefighters need to be trained commensurate to the duties of auto extrication. The same would go for hazardous materials. At what level does your fire department respond to hazardous materials incidents? Are you an awareness level fire department where your fire department responds to the scene and says, yes, we have a hazardous material that has hazardous material has been identified as chlorine. And now we need the experts to come in and handle the chlorine. Or is your fire department more than likely an operational fire department where you respond to a reported motor vehicle accident, you come across a leaking gasoline tank from a motor vehicle collision and your your firefighters have been trained at the operation level of hazardous materials, which means they can plug the hole and then do some form of diking uh, to keep the gasoline from getting into the sewer system and maybe put some speedy dry down. Or are you full on technician level where you can actually handle the hazardous materials yourself, wear a class, or a class A suits or a class B suit and enter an IDLH using those suits. So depending on the level of your hazardous materials response is that level of training you need to give to the firefighters. And that's going to be both on an initial basis and annual. The same would hold true for your technical rescue aspect. So that would include rope, water, ice, uh, uh, maybe collapse training, trench rescue, okay? So if you have this equipment and you as an organization state that you provide this service and you respond to these incidents, we need to train your firefighters commensurate to the duty of technical rescue. Now, just because your fire district has a river running straight through it doesn't mean that you have to perform water rescue operation or that you need to train your firefighters in water rescue. You need to train your firefighters in water rescue if you have identified through your organizational statement that you respond to and provide uh, water rescue operations. Now, if you had a river going through your fire district, I would suggest that you did have at least some equipment, including throw bags and uh, uh, flotation devices, and train your firefighters commensurate to that duty. Because should a situation arise, firefighters aren't really good at standing on the bank and watching people drown. They're probably going to get involved. The same would hold true for rapid intervention equipment. Okay, so if you have a RIC team and your RIC team responds to mutual aid or mutual assistance to the neighboring fire department to provide a RIC team while they operate at a structure fire then your firefighters need to be trained in the operation of rapid intervention. Uh, so basically what happens is we say that if your fire department responds to it or you have a potential for responding to it, or you have the equipment or provide the service, then your firefighters need to be trained in both the knowledge and skill ability commensurate to those abilities that you expect them to do or perform. That would even include maybe a Marine unit. So we should treat our marine unit the same that we would treat a, a, treat a land-based engine company. So if your firefighters are expected to operate a marine-based unit, then you would train them commensurate to that duty as well. Okay, so now once we've identified the needs and we figure out exactly what training we need to get to our firefighters uh, in, in our organization, we now need to develop a program that will meet those requirements. And that program development, uh, it's 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 based on that assessment of the uh, job or excuse me the, the organizational statement, and then what we do from the organizational statement is we figure out what jobs need to be done within that organizational statement to perform those services that we're going to perform, and that's how we identify job descriptions. So we create a job description, and we develop these to meet the needs of that organizational statement. If you're a structural firefighting operation, then you develop a job description for an interior structural firefighter. And that firefighter would have to have certain skills that he or she can perform. And they would have certain knowledge that they must have for them to operate on the fire ground. So what we do is we develop those job descriptions for each position. Maybe you have firefighters who are just support level firefighters. Maybe they only respond to incidents and perform um, uh, SCBA exchange or maybe they take care of some air bottles. Uh, so those firefighters, their job description would mean that they're not interior firefighters, but they are support level firefighters, separate job description. But all these job descriptions are gonna be based on job performance requirements. So 
depending on the job and what the job is responsible for on the fire ground, we create job performance requirements or JPRs for each one of these descriptions. So the JPR, what that does is it describes the performance required for a specific job. The example that we're going to use throughout this uh, uh, webinar today is ground ladder operation. So if we have a fire department that is a structural uh, fire department that responds to structure fires, one of the job descriptions would be interior firefighter. The interior firefighter at some point is going to have to be able to carry, raise, and climb a ground ladder. So one of our job performance requirements for that job description of interior firefighter would be ground ladder skills. So what happens is we group all of these JPRs according to their tactic and task. And one of their tactics might be ventilation. If we're performing ventilation, we need to be able to operate a ground ladder. If we are performing vent under search through the second floor, we need to be able to operate a ground ladder. So we create these JPRs and it's gonna define the skill that the firefighter must have to be able to perform those duties. So at the base of both that ventilation operation as well as vent under search is that ground ladder skill. So we create a JPR that's based on the skill, but we, we reference that according to NFPA 1001. So we reference NFPA 1001, the firefighter professional standard. We look into the standard where it says ground ladder, chapter 4.3.6. And we say the firefighter, the NFPA standard says the firefighter must have the following knowledge and be able to perform the following skill. So we take that skill and build our GPR out of it. Once we understand the skills that we are gonna to have to develop and we understand the knowledge that our firefighter is gonna to need to perform those skills, we have to develop some curriculum to actually present that to the firefighter through a formal process. And that's where we develop our lessons. So we develop lessons to deliver that knowledge and skill. And that's gonna be in the form of, of, of a presentation to the firefighter for each one of those job performance requirements that we have listed, okay? And it's gonna be much more than just the ground ladder operation, obviously. So we're gonna have an entire list of those JPRs for every skill that we're gonna require those firefighters to perform. And then we're gonna develop a lesson to teach that knowledge and skill for each one of those JPRs. Now, once we develop a lesson, we have to develop a delivery method to present each one of these lessons to the firefighter, okay? So we base these methods on what the skill or knowledge requirement actually is. Most often, we're talking about training and drilling, okay? So those are our typical training uh, delivery methods in the fire service, both training and drilling. Now, often, we use this training and drilling uh, uh, interchangeably. We say, uh, uh, we're gonna do some training today. We're gonna do some drilling today. And often to some firefighters or some uh, uh, fire service training officers, these might seem like they are the same, but they are drastically different because training is a formal method of presenting or introducing that new skill or knowledge. So we sit the firefighter down and this is where we show them what right looks like. And it's very important that we do that because if we don't, have a standard method for showing the firefighter what right looks like. If we had somebody who should teach them a wrong skill, then that wrong skill gets uh, perpetuated all down the line because eventually the firefighter, the new firefighter that we're teaching this new skill to, when we teach them something wrong, they eventually become a senior firefighter and then they train the next person. And before you know it, this wrong thing that was taught to them a long time ago now goes on to the next generation of firefighter and so on and so forth. So we use this training method as a formal method to introduce the new knowledge or skill and show them what right looks like. We show them what the skill actually looks like when performed correctly. Then we allow the firefighter to practice that new knowledge or skill through a drilling process. So drilling is the psychomotor operation. It's the physical operation of putting your hands on whatever skill or knowledge that we're teaching. The way that we deliver this is typically training is delivered through a lecture or some form of discussion or presentation like what we're doing here. And then our delivery method for those skill drills is typically a demonstration where we're showing the firefighter what right looks like, or it's actually viewing a video where the video has gone through and shown what that skill looks like. So the lecture, uh, typically uh, lecture and discussions, they're gonna be instructor led presentations where the instructor gets up in front of an audience and uses a PowerPoint presentation to probably deliver some new knowledge to the firefighter or review knowledge that's already had and we're reviewing it for the end. Now the demonstration video 
This is where we show the skill. We show what the skill looks like when performed correctly. So demonstration is actually showing the skill where the presentation is delivering the knowledge or the, the, what, the, what the firefighter needs to know for that operation. So the skill drill itself in the evolution is be the next step that we move up to after we've shown them what right looks like. And then we've had them put their hands on the ladder for the first time. And then now what we're gonna do is have them continually practice this through skill drill, okay? So this is where we practice that skill requirement over and over and over again until the firefighter develops muscle memory. And this is real critical here because whenever we're teaching a skill, what we want to develop is muscle memory built into that skill or operation. And muscle memory becomes critically important because what we want firefighters to do when they're on the fire ground is we want the firefighter on the fire ground to be able to take care of or realize situational awareness of what's going on around them, what is unique to the situation that they've responded to. We want the firefighter skill of throwing that ground ladder on this fire ground to be memorized by the muscle itself. And what we mean by that, muscle memory, is if you've ever driven to work uh, and got to work and said, did I stop at that stop sign at such and such intersection? That's muscle memory because your mind has, has gone through that drive to work so many different times that you don't have to think about it anymore. You can now, you can go through the drive in your body, your muscle memory takes you to the right place that you're going without really thinking about it. That allows your mind to be on other things. Now, the first time that you drove to work, you probably had to think about it. But over time, over repetitive operation of driving the same way to work every single morning, you developed muscle memory. Okay. So the evolution, this is now where we apply that new skill. Uh, we're going to apply it in some form of a scenario. And what that means is we might not just take one skill here, we might take multiple skills, put them into an actual simulated operation in a controlled environment, such as a training ground, and let the firefighters work out these skills that they've been practicing, bringing them together with multiple different skills and applying them to a certain situation. Uh, so my example here, since we've been talking about ground ladders, is maybe we're going to do a vent and a search uh, rescue evolution. So at some point, we allowed the firefighter, we taught the firefighter ground ladder carry, raise, and climb. We taught them how to properly search a building, how to properly go through a window, how to locate victims, how to remove victims. And all these different skills were taught in different training sessions throughout a period of time. And now what's happening is we're applying all those different skills that we taught into one evolution and allowing them to apply the skill that they've been practicing. Uh, in, a, in a real life scenario. So now, once we developed how we're gonna do all that, we now need to operate that program. We need to put it into a logical sequence and get it out to our firefighters in a method that will work for them so that they can both retain the skill and understand the development. So that's program operation. Okay, so Vigilant, what we use is a program methodology called proficiency cycle training. This is a cycle that works to build competency in any skill that we put into the program, okay? It always starts with training, and the goal here is to end with mastery of skill. So we literally start with introducing this new skill or knowledge to a firefighter who may have never heard or seen this before, and the cycle only ends after they have mastered that new skill or knowledge. And it always begins with training, and training is that that formal presentation that introduces a new concept or skill. Uh, that's that formal presentation, kind of like what we're doing here. Maybe it's a PowerPoint, or it might just be an instructor-led uh, discussion, or we might be demonstrating something or showing a video. But we're allowing the firefighter to see what right looks like. And we're teaching them the safety aspects of the operation. We're teaching them all of the different components of the operation. And we're teaching them all about the operation itself and how it fits into the operations that are going on around it. So when we use our ground ladder example here, we're going to introduce the firefighter to the ground ladder. We're gonna teach them what the beams are. We're gonna teach them what the rungs are, that the rungs are 14 inches apart, what the difference is between a straight ladder and an extension ladder. We're going to go through all of the knowledge-based requirements that they're going to need to safely operate the ground ladder on the fire ground. 
and we're going to deliver that to them in a formal presentation. Once we've done that, we will move to the drilling portion of it. And during the drilling portion of it, this is where we're going to have the firefighter perform that skill or concept through repetitive practice as we work to develop that muscle memory. So we use a five-step psychomotor process to deliver that new skill. And it always begins with the instructor showing the firefighter what the skill looks like when performed at full speed. So in our ground ladder operation, the fire instructor would show the firefighter what it looks like to raise the ground ladder at full speed without verbalizing any portion of the actual skill itself. Their next step would be to perform the skill at half speed, and this time verbalizing each step and explaining each part of raising the ground ladder as they are performing that. The third step would be the instructor again is going to perform that skill at half speed, but this time the student will explain each step. The fourth step in this is the student now actually performs the skill for the first time. They are allowed to practice the skill, touch the actual skill, and get their hands on. So all we've done to this point is engage cognitively, but at step four, we're engaging both cognitively and psychomotor or at the skill level, because the student's gonna perform the skill again at half speed, but explain every step as to what they're doing. And then the five step, the fifth step of this process is the student's gonna perform that skill at full speed. And then they're gonna to continue to practice this or continue to drill this until we can now take that drilling, that skill that they practiced, and apply it to an evolution, apply it to some scenario or uh, 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 skill uh, scenario that's, that's in a controlled environment, such as a training ground, or maybe a different type of evolution in the classroom. At the same time, we allow them to apply that uh, evolution, that skill to that evolution. We're evaluating exactly how well that firefighter is doing. But we're not evaluating the individual firefighter like we were with our JPRs. What we're doing is we're assessing the entire company, okay? And it's a concept that we call company competency. So we want to see that the company is operating together as a team and performing uh, uh, as they should. So if this was a been under search operation, as we've been talking about, we watch them practice the skill drill well, with the raising and, and, and carrying of the ladders. We then apply it in an evolution where they have to vent enter search of building using a ground ladder to the second floor. And as they're doing this, we're evaluating them as to how each one of those skills, each one of those job performance requirements that we have been teaching, how well they are operating at that level. Now, if we notice at some point there's a deficiency in this operation, we identify something that's not going quite right, or maybe an issue with safety, or maybe a skill that just needs to be developed a little bit further, or maybe there's not exactly muscle memory developed yet, what we do is we remediate that training. <clears throat> so now we go into a remediation process where we develop a new training plan, right, or a new training operation, and we give the firefighter training again, and then some drilling, and then apply it in the evolution that we evaluate. And this process continues, training, drilling, evolution application that we evaluate, and then remediate if we find deficiencies. This continues until we develop mastery. And once mastery has been developed, we either go to a maintenance level of maintaining that level of mastery on that skill, or in our ground ladder skill, maybe we've been teaching them the suitcase carry along with raising the uh, uh, ladder using the butt end to the building. Now maybe we're gonna move to a little more complicated ground ladder skill of carrying the ladder in a high shoulder carry and using a high shoulder raise to get that ladder up. And then we just repeat that process until again, they've mastered the high shoulder raise just as they mastered the suitcase carrier raise. Okay, so now what we wanted to discuss a little bit more today is that actual operation. So operating this program, how do we operate this uh, methodology? How do, we, how do we make this happen? And the best way to do that is to develop an actual plan, okay? So just like we would build a house using blueprints and a plan, uh, we're going to build our training program using a plan and it's gonna be based on an annual uh, 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 process, okay? So what we wanna do is we wanna take those proficiency cycles that we just talked about to deliver those, the curriculum, but we wanna use a logical sequence to deliver all of this training in a manageable block. 
just like we listed 10 different things that the fire service training officer has to do uh, it, it, to manage their program effectively, we took those 10 things and broke them down into five blocks. What we want to do is we want to take our curriculum that we're going to deliver, our entire plan that we need to deliver to the firefighter, and break it down into manageable blocks again. And we're going to use a logical sequence to deliver that so that the firefighter can understand one concept before they take on the next. And that's basically like the crawl, walk, run idea of, of, of delivering training. Manageable blocks delivered in a logical sequence. Okay. And now some of these skills are going to have to be practiced on a weekly basis, some every other couple of weeks, while other skills maybe you can get away with monthly or quarterly and even more uh, 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 or least requirement of their skills can be performed annually. So let's look at what we had talked about before earlier, where we looked at mandate training. So sexual uh, uh, harassment, workplace violence, those are things that we can probably get away with teaching annually. Quarterly, maybe something where we want to apply an evolution every single quarter, where we're getting multiple companies together on the training grounds and, and doing that on a quarterly basis. Monthly would be one of those things where you want to be performing the skills that you use the most, at least reviewing them on a monthly basis. And then weekly, every single week, we should be reviewing our PPE and SCBA. Not going through a full review, but using that PPE and SCBA in another skill drill that's applying another skill. Okay, so that's what we're going to be looking at now. We're taking a little bit deeper dive into how we put this all together into a plan. So the training plan uh, basically gets developed into a session schedule. And we take everything that needs to be de delivered during the plan or through the plan, and we break it up into individual sessions. Uh, and that's the sessions are going to be based on that weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, quarterly schedule that we just got done uh, reviewing. And each topic, though, that we get into is going to begin with one of those training presentations where we're introducing the knowledge and skill ability to the firefighter followed by a skill drill where they're applying, or excuse me, practicing that skill using the, 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 the new knowledge or skill that we just taught them in the formal training presentation. They're gonna be performing this over and over and over again so that they can uh, develop their muscle memory. Now, once they practice this drill, we apply it to that evolution that we talked about. And the cycle repeats itself because we test it during one of those company competencies. So let's take a look at the actual training plan itself and how it's broken down and what it does. So if we go all the way back to the beginning, we, we, we said that we have certain training needs or certain training requirements that have to happen. Those are external requirements that are brought to us uh, by, by means outside of our control. So they're brought to us from a government aid entity uh, uh, that, that we don't have any say over, but it still has to happen. That training still has to happen. And then we identify internal training needs. And those are the skills of the actual jobs that we're going to be performing. So that's our, that's our job performance requirements that are based on our job descriptions. And then we have other training that needs to be met such as uh, ISO requirements. Um, so ISO has their own set of requirements where they require a certain amount of hours to be trained on in certain categories throughout the year. So that doesn't really change any of our requirements, but what it does is it takes other requirement that we need depending on our organizational statement <clears throat> and we just we pigeonhole that need or that requirement into the same hour requirement of ISO. But the only way to do this, the only way to take everything that we're talking about, put it into a nice neat box is through a, a, a annual training plan. And Vigilant develops annual training plans for hundreds of fire departments throughout the country every year. This is an example of one and what it would look like. So at the top here, you'll notice that <clears throat> this one was used for a fire department in New York State. And New York State has a what's called uh, uh, New York State Best Practices for Fire Service Training Programs. And there's a list of topics and categories that need to be trained on, on both uh, an initial and annual basis. So it took all of those needs of the fire department, uh, both their external and their internal, depending on what they were performing for an operation and put it into this, this plan. And the plan basically starts out in January. And you'll notice at the top, we have the month where it tells us, so in January, the topic that we're gonna cover is safety. We're gonna be doing four hours of safety training. You'll notice that the next line there at the top in green 
is four hours of company training. That's the ISO identification. So the ISO requires a certain number of hours of what they call company training. And during the month of January, this training plan is going to deliver four of those hours. In this training plan, knots, ropes and knots are handled on a monthly basis where the firefighters train or practice a specific knot for every given uh, month. The month of January just happens to be they're practicing the figure eight on a bite. Now, the next thing is, is we get into the actual training sessions themselves. And in this plan, what the plan does is it identifies exactly what will be taught. So it's personal protective equipment. It identifies the lesson plan that they'll be using. So last week when we reviewed the lesson plans, we talked about how that cover sheet is so important and it gives you an idea of exactly what training is gonna happen according to that plan, all in one sheet. Well, this kind of gives us the same information here because we have an, a, uh, a lesson plan number, so it identifies that lesson plan. This number is gonna be 1931. And it's covering one of those external requirements as well, because in New York State, firefighters are required to meet this uh, best practice 4.110, which is understanding uh, your personal protective equipment and SCBA. Those best practices are based on NFPA 1001 as well. So this lesson has been developed exactly as we have spoken about during this webinar uh, using NFPA 1001 as a reference. And now we can see a cross-reference here in an external state requirement, which is also interesting at this point. So now we see that the instructor is going to have a couple of tasks. So the plan lays out exactly what the instructor is going to do. So the fire instructor who was assigned this task, okay, they're going to have to reserve a classroom. There must be some media as part of this presentation. So they're going to inspect their media and they're going to prepare the lesson that they've been given. Okay. And again, they're going to be using lesson plan number 1931. We then have a description of what the lesson is actually going to be. So that first lesson of the year is going to be a training session. It's going to be a PowerPoint presentation and skill demonstration. So two of those key words that we just got done discussing. So we're going to see a PowerPoint presentation, which is going to be that formal application of, uh, of knowledge and skill ability to the firefighter using um, uh, uh, training. And then there's going to be a skill demonstration. So it looks like here what's going to happen is the instructor uh, themselves are going to demonstrate the skill of, uh, of, of personal protective equipment care. So that what this lesson is going to do is it's going to tell the firefighters how to manage and take care of their personal protective equipment as far as inspecting it, washing it, and then drying it and storing it, so on and so forth. So the training plan lay, lay, gives us exactly what we're going to be doing for that actual operation. The training goal here for this first session here is the goal of this training is to develop proficiency in the care, use, and inspection of structural firefighting uh, personal protective equipment. So it tells us exactly what it's going to do, and it gives us the objectives, both the terminal and the enabling objectives. <coughs> and if you can remember last week when we discussed objectives, remember that terminal objective is the overall what we're going to accomplish. So it's that big thing that we're going to accomplish through this training. And then those enabling objectives are the little small steps as to how we're going to accomplish the overall big thing. So the next uh, session that is going to take place in January, we can see here because we've got the year, the month, and the session number. So it was this was for the year 2020. It's the month one, which is January. And this is the second session of the month. And it starts telling us here that we're going to get into um, – risk management now. So, and again, the instructor task is here. What's gonna happen in this course is here. Uh, what, what external requirement it meets, the lesson plan number is given, so on and so forth. And if we go to page two, you see that this now repeats again for the month of February. So as we move into February, we're still on that safety topic. There's gonna to be four more hours of training delivered by this plan to the fire department. Uh, and those, are, again, are going to be four hours of company training, according to ISO. And the knot this month that they're going to do in February now is the double loop figure eight. So they've built on their single loop figure eight on a bike. Now they're going to be training on the double loop figure eight. And in February here, it looks like we're going to be getting into SCBA. So it's going to be four hours of SCBA training. And that's going to begin here with lesson plan 1951, which is SCBA review. And it tells the instructor exactly what they have to do again here. They got to reserve a classroom, prepare the lesson, and they have to dedicate an area for skills. 
uh, and acquire teaching aids. Probably they need to get a couple of SCBAs and maybe some SCBA masks to review with the firefighters. Um, and this is going to now be an evolution. So uh, there's an evolution for this that they explain, uh, and it's going to be an SCBA Don and Doff drill. Uh, and the instructor here is going to be presenting that lesson and coaching. So he's going to be coaching the skills, trying to develop uh, those skills as we're performing the operation in the drill. And again, training goal is given along with the objectives. So you can see here, without going line by line through the annual training plan, it literally delivers exactly what's gonna happen, what requirement's gonna be met, and how that requirement's gonna be met uh, in a monthly basis. And it's broken down and it goes all the way through uh, uh, the entire year. So if you remember the next step, once we had developed that plan, we take the plan and we turn it into a session schedule. So what's, what, we started this whole discussion out this morning with asking, have you ever gone to the firehouse and heard the term, what are we doing for drill tonight, okay? Uh, we say this and we open up every single presentation that we do on managing the fire service training program like that because it's such a critical thing to understand. Adult learners must be, uh, they must understand what, is, what their expectation level is. So adult learners do very poorly in situations where they don't know what's about to happen. In other words, they don't like to be surprised. So the adult learner, uh, to satisfy uh, uh, that, we want to be able to give them as much information upfront as possible. So there are fire departments uh, that will actually give that training plan to all of their members. So they know exactly what's going on. But at a bare minimum, a bare minimum, our adult learners are gonna want to have a basic session schedule. They're gonna want to know what drill is on any given uh, presentation night or time, okay? So now you can see that that plan here has just been brought right into a simple schedule where we talk about the topic. If you remember those topics that we talked about were personal safety. The two lessons given in January are gonna be PPE maintenance and care. And the second one being risk management. The instructor in this has not been assigned yet, but we can see that the evaluation for that lesson uh, is going to be a GPR. So the GPR, that job performance requirement, now also becomes the evaluation tool for any skill drill. And you'll go down through here and understand that if we have cognitive lessons that we're teaching, so uh, if we went down to fire behavior, we're going to have a lesson about fire behavior basics, you'll see that that lesson is evaluated using a quiz. And that might be a formal quiz or it might be an informal quiz. Uh, and it all depends on the situation that you're teaching. <coughs> so that is our basic training plan and then train on that training plan into a session schedule, okay? Now, the next step is we need to evaluate our program. So just as we evaluated our firefighter skill level to see what skills we needed to teach or what skills we needed to brush up on, we also need to evaluate our own program, exactly what we've been talking about here, okay? So program evaluation, it's gotta be evaluated just as we evaluate the firefighters because we have to have an understanding of how effective our program is being, okay? So if we've been teaching ground ladders through this training program, <coughs> excuse me again, and we get to December and we've been teaching the ground ladders one way all year long, and we go to a, uh, a, a fire in December, and we notice that all the ground ladders have put up to the building have been put up with their butt in the air and the tip to the ground. There's a problem. Where does that problem lie? Is that problem why? with the firefighter skill ability, or is the problem in the training uh, ability, okay? We have to evaluate all of our lessons, our presentations, and specifically our instructors. Because what if we went back and looked at this pro program and said, holy cow, there are fire instructors, they had it backwards. The lesson literally said that the tip goes on the ground and the buck goes in the air. Well, that would be a huge training program failure, not the failure of a personal skill or a group of skills, that's gonna be, be a failure of the training program. So we evaluate those lessons, we evaluate the presentations and we evaluate the instructors so we can make that better. So we can improve our program and make sure that the program is teaching and being effective at teaching what we are trying to deliver, okay? And we can manage this through pre and post testing, which is the easiest way uh, to do it. But this doesn't mean that we have to give our firefighters uh, a 100 question test in January and then a 100 question test in December. Uh, what we mean by pre and post testing is we give them some form of, eval of evaluation prior 
to delivering a lesson. And then we give them some form of evaluation after we deliver the lesson and we see what the difference is. We should see a, 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 a drastic improvement here. And I'm not talking about handing out uh, um, multiple choice questions. There's many different ways to do that. And we'll be talking about some of those ways in upcoming webinars. Okay, so once we evaluate the program, now we have to develop some record retention, okay? So we have to, if we have to retain all of those records that we developed in those other four steps. So the biggest thing we have to come across here and understand is that unrecorded training did not happen. And this is not one of our rules. This is going to be a rule if you ever, God forbid, had to testify in a court of law. If you don't have documentation that can prove uh, beyond a shadow of doubt what training happened and what training didn't happen, then no training happened at all. Okay, So it's important because we have to, we have to at least have records of every training session. And what we do is we create a training report for those training sessions. And that training report can be pulled right off of the training plan. So in other words, we can put exactly what we did into the training report, just as it is in the training plan. So once we develop our training plan, which is what we've been talking about today, it also makes everything else that we do easier because I can literally copy and paste my description from my training plan onto my training report. And then once it's on there, all I have to do is add an attendance. So every individual member who was there goes on that attendance and then every individual member of my fire department also is going to have a permanent record of their own training completions. So not only their training completions or their drill completions, but they're also going to have a record of their initial training. So that's when they went to proby school or some form of fire academy. They're also going to have records of all their in-house training. That's the drills that they attended or classes that they attended with inside the organization itself. And they're also going to have records for their external uh, training uh, that they did, maybe at a state fire academy or a seminar or even a webinar like what we're doing here today, which is why we give out a certificate for your completion of this course. So that your training uh, officer can have a record of your completion of this course, and that would go in your permanent record. Now, that permanent record is going to be maintained uh, for a certain amount of time. And the way that we know how long that time is going to be is usually according to state law. So every single state, all 50 states have their own um, record schedule for uh, record maintenance. So they tell you exactly what records need to be maintained, how long they need to be maintained, how to maintain them, and then how to actually destroy the record or get rid of that record once it no longer needs to be maintained. And that's all done at the state level. So the way that we figure that out is when we're doing our needs assessment, we also review the state requirements for uh, record maintenance schedules. So review, we go over that needs assessment, we figure out exactly what training we need during that needs assessment. And that needs assessment is going to look at both external and internal requirements, with external requirements being those requirements that are outside of our control. They're not from our purview, they're from a state or federal agency. And then we look at the internal requirements that we need. And those internal requirements are based on exactly what the function of our fire department is and the function of our organization is, and that's the training that we're gonna do based on those job descriptions and job performance requirements. And once we've figured that out, we develop a program, we come up with curriculum and lessons to uh, 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 deliver that knowledge and scalability to the firefighter using a, a logical presentation. And we put that together into a methodology that applies the training, drilling, evolution, evaluation, retention, uh, and, and we keep repeating that process into that proficiency cycle that we talked about. And then once we have all that figured out, we actually operate the program where we develop a training plan, come up with a session schedule, and develop uh, a way to deliver all of this training that we just got done developing with our, our curriculum and put that out in a logical sequence. Once we've operated that for a year, we have to figure out how our program is operating. Is the program delivering what we need to, to deliver? Is our, our, our firefighters improving in their skill? Are we building that core muscle memory that we keep talking about? Is that working or do we need to make adjustments in maybe our presentations, our lessons, or even our fire instructors? And then last but not least, and almost most importantly, is that record retention. Training that wasn't recorded didn't happen. So we need to understand how to record every aspect of the training program operation, as well as how to maintain those records and keep those records on file as well as destroying them when the time has come to destroy them. 
So that's the review for today. Uh, and that was our uh, week five down already. Uh, and that was basically how to manage the fire service training program as a whole, along with some uh, deeper look into the training plan. So I basically now will turn it back over to Chris and we can answer any questions that you had uh, during the chat, or if you have any now, feel free to pop them in and we will get right back to you. Chris, I'll turn it back over to you. Awesome, thanks so much for hanging out. I'm gonna give everybody a uh, additional second to ask a question if they would like. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you for joining us for week five of our Managing Fire Service Training Webinar Series. Be on the lookout for the remainder of the series and be sure to sign up. We would love the opportunity to work more closely with you to help you accomplish your training goals. Our system can help you to provide your organization with training, tracking, and managing your fire service training. So please head to cypherworks.com for more information. Be sure to save the certificate for your professional development records. And I look forward to seeing you in future webinars. I hope you have a great day. Thanks, Todd. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.